Hello, hi. Uh, my name is uh, Henry Chen, and I'm from Purdue University. And uh, I just first want to thank the, the organizer give us this opportunity to present uh, our work. And uh, as the first slide show, um, today I'm going to talk about the role of activated CDC42 kinase in Drosophila splenogenesis. So what is activated CDC42 kinase? So it is a non-receptor tyrosine kinase. Tyrosine kinase could be receptor or non-receptor. ACK1 is a non-receptor tyrosine kinase. It was originally identified as uh, a, uh, a non-receptor kinase that can bind to activated CDC42, hence the name ACK, activated CDC42 kinase. In general, the domain structure has the, the N-terminus stereo motif followed by a tyrosine kinase motif and then an SS3 domain and then the CRIP domain, the CRIP stands for CDC42 RAC interactive binding domain that allows to bind to CDC42 and then also follow with a C-terminal ubiquitin association domain that regulates the, the, the protein stability of ACK and its substrates. So when you compare ACK to other mammalian non-receptor tyrosine kinases, and there are 10 families, and then ACK is right here, a couple of things that stands out. First, the position of the SH3 domain is C-terminal to the kinase domain, and where the other non-receptor tyrosine kinases, they have the SH3 domain and terminal to the kinase domain. So this suggests that ACK is regulated differently. The second thing is the presence of this group domain. This group domain allows ACK to bind to CC42, which is a very important regulator of um, cytoskeleton arrangement and as well as cell polarity. So, so this ACK, which is uh, tyrosine kinase, is important for transduction. In addition, it can bind to a very important regulator of cytoskeleton. So why is ACK interesting? So ACK has been implicated in cancer. So when you do comparative genomic study, what's found is that overactivity of ACK gene correlate with the ability of cancer cell to metastasize. In addition, in tumor samples, mutation in ACK has been found. This is primarily done by Tom Miller's group, and this mutation in the same domain, kinase, and then S2 domain. Then when they measure the mutation, this mutation in vitro, they found this mutation usually increase the ACK kinase activity. So again, consistent with the idea that when you have too much ACK uh, function, it correlate with cancer. In addition, in the prostate cancer, it's been shown that ACK can respond to activity of activation of insulin receptor, EG receptor, and it can activate downstream oncogenes such as antigen receptor, AKT, or it can inhibit the activity of tumor suppressor gene WWOX. So therefore, there seems to be some correlation between ACK and cancer, and then so there is an interest in uh, its function as well as trying to use it as a target for drugs against cancer. So mammals have two ACK-related genes. One is called ACK1, the other one is called TNK1. The major difference between ACK1 and TNK1 is the presence of this crib domain. You see crib domain in ACK1, but you don't see crib domain in TNK1. And ACK1, as I mentioned before, has implicated in cancer. TNK1 is less well understood, but has been implicated in tumor genesis as well. When you have mouse knockout TNK1, it has, they have elevated rate of spontaneous tumors. Okay, I apologize, this slide is kind of messed up, but here shows the ACK family, again, 
uh, in ACK1, you have the crypto domain. In TNK1, you do not have the crypto domain. And then Drosophila, which is be the, the organism I've described today, also have two ACK family, Drosophila ACK and Drosophila PR2. Again, the sequence level, ACK is actually more closely related to mammalian ACK. Here is a, the ACK, Drosophila ACK is closely related to mammalian ACK, but the Drosophila ACK miss, is missing the crypto domain. On the other hand, the Drosophila PR2 has the crypto domain, but at the sequence level, it's more distant from mammalian ACK. So now interest in ACK is its role in endocytosis. And uh, in mammalian cells, it's been suggested that ACK associates clotting and then mediates the internalization of EGO receptor. So in this context, ACK is supposed to facilitate the down-regulation of activated EGO receptor. Therefore, it negatively regulates EGF signal. So it's different from the previous world where hyperactivation cause cancer. Then consistent with this role in clotting mediated endocytosis, ACK has been shown to uh, in facilitate internalization of transform receptor, but this, uh, this role in this process is kinase independent. And then recently, um, an AC homolog in C. organ C3 has been found to be required for intercellular transport of uh, double strand uh, siRNA. So for those who are not familiar with clathrin, and then clathrin is a major pathway for endocytosis. And then here it describes the, the major pathway of this uh, process. So you have plasma membrane, and then you have uh, a cargo, which then has signal that recruits clathrin adapter. Then clathrin adapter binds the cargo, then recruits clathrin triskelion. As the clathrin polymerizes, you form um, it forms this uh, clotting coated pits and then causes membrane invagination. Eventually, you have clotting coated vesicle, and this is uh, severed from the plasma membrane by the action of dynamine. Eventually, you have clotting coated vesicle, then the clotting uh, coats are dissociated by the action of H70 and then uh, auxiliary protein. So, the idea is that the ACK associates clotting and then recruits activate each receptor to clathrin and then remove them from the cell surface so you have less signaling. So part of this slide again is kind of messed up here, but what it shows that another ACE function ACK has is anti-cell death. And then this is shown by Jim, um, in Joseph is shown by uh, Jim Clemens, who identified ACK by its ability to bind to DAC protein. Uh, it's an adaptive protein, this would come in uh, become important later. So what she showed here is that if you express a gene, a pro apoptotic gene like HID, which will cause the eye to be smaller, then when you overexpress the, uh, the, uh, the ACK, the eye will become bigger. So ACK can prevent the cell from dying. So all these are overexpression. So now we are interested in what is the normal function of ACK. And then we hope to do this. Then when we understand what ACK does under normal condition, then we can have a better appreciation how certain mutation allow them to cause cancer. So we use Drosophila to investigate the normal function of ACK. So Drosophila, like mammals, have two ACK homologs and we're gonna call them DACK and PR2. Again, to remind you, DACK has a higher sequence similarity to mammalian ACK1, but does not have the crypto domain. So not a whole lot is known about ACK in Drosophila. It's been used by Nick Harden to study a process called dorsal closure. So what dorsal closure is during Drosophila embryogenesis, and it has a German retraction, which leaves a hole on the dorsal side of the embryo, then the epidermis on the lateral side will expand and then to close this hole. So failure to do so will generate a hole in this embryo. 
And this process makes sense because this expansion of the uh, epidermis on the lateral side is supposed to require to uh, supposed to require CC42, and it was proposed that ACK act downstream of CC42 in this process. However, the penetrance of this phenotype is pretty low. So it's not, for us, it was not the best phenotype to study use genetics. So we decided to look what else is affected by ACK mutation. Okay, so the few major questions we want to address is intracellular, what does ACK do? What does PR2 do? Are these two ACK homologs redundant? And then what's the functional link between ACK family kinase to CC42? That's an important question because this family of non receptor kinase is defined by the ability to bind to CC42. And what's the importance of that link? Okay, so first we work on ACK. So Nick Harden has general mutant ACK86 shown here, and it deletes the uh, transcription star site. To make sure that this mutation is null, we use a probe, probe uh, here in the coding region, and we show that by RT-PCR that this ACK86 does not generate any messenger RNA, so it's a, a null allele. Mutants homozygous for ACK86 are viable. That indicates that ACK is not an essential gene. The flies survive. But the male flies are completely sterile. They do not, produ they do not produce any progeny. So to ask, this sterility is caused by prezygotic or postzygotic mechanism, we look at the ACK testes. So what you see here is a wild type testes and then stand, carry a down one GFP, which labels a sperm tail. And also labels uh, phalloidin, which labels actin, and then DNA. So, but the important here is the down one GFP, which labels sperm tail. So in a wild type, you can see spermatid developing in the testes. In addition, you see mature sperm being deposited into this structure called a seminal vesicle, labeled by the open arrow here. In ACK mutant, you still see spermatid developing in the testes, but if, when you look at a seminal vesicle, there are no mature sperms. So somewhere along the way, ACK mutation blocks sperm development. And then we are actually very happy when um, we look at the fly base to look at the ACK expression during development. AC, ACK is expressed ubiquitously, but its expression is highest in male testes, consistent with the fact that we see male phenotype, male stereotype phenotype. So then to understand how ACK perturb sperm development, I'm gonna give you a quick crash course on the Drosophila spermogenesis. So here is Drosophila uh, female and Drosophila male. And then the length of a typical fly is about 2.5 millimeter. Drosophila has unusually long sperm. The mature sperm in male average about 1.8 millimeter, almost the full body length. So when you open up the body cavity and then look at the, the testes, you can see um, each male have two pairs of testes and so, and then um, they, they coil around um, uh, this structure right here, this tubular structure right here. And inside the testes, that's where the male germ cell developed. And then the sequence is such that you have a, a hub at the apical end, then you have the germ stem cell right next to the hub. The germ stem cell undergo a symmetric cell division, generate a spermogonium which undergo mitosis, then meiosis, then generate 64 interconnected spermatid. Then this spherical spermatid undergo dramatic cell transformation, it elongate, reach 1.8 millimeter in length, and it's still connected. Then there's this process called individualization, um, 
characterized by this formation of the actin cone that moves along the sperm tail from the nuclei end all the way to the tail end, and which will separate each spermatid into a separate sperm. Then the sperm will coil, and then they will move to the seminal vesicles. Okay. Again, we were interested in this because we were studying clathrin, and then we, was, we know that clathrin is involved in, this is green, the clathrin involved in germ cells, and then we were interested in uh, uh, how um, ACK associated clathrin may be involved in sperm development. Okay, so this slide seems very complicated, but it's not. Basically, it's wild type testes and an ACK mutant testes stand for down one GAP, which labels sperm tail, blue is DNA, and then phalloidin is the actin, which labels the actin cones. So in a wild type, you can see um, elongated spermat uh, spermatid, the actin cone have not assembled, number one. Number two represent the elongated spermatid where the actin cone, actin cone just assembled. And number three labels the, the spermatid that the actin cone have departed. So in wild type, you can see all three uh, stages. In the mutant, you can also see one, two, and three, all three stages. So as far as the number of cell different stages, there's, there's little difference between wild type and mutant. Then when we look at the migrating cone, in the wild type, you can see migrating cone here and the high max showing in the inset here and then showing the mutant here, again, the morphology and the number of actin cone migrating look the same. The difference between wild type and mutant, the first difference we saw was in a spermatic coin. When the individualization is completed, the spermatic became the coil, you see a nice coil in wild type, but we do not see coin in mutant. And then we think the mutants, uh, in the mutants, the testes actually, the, the germ cell has actually become tangled. Okay, so now what we want to do is ask when and where is ACK gene required for spermogenesis. So to do this, we put ACK under two different promoters. One is beta tubulin, the other one is down one promoter. And in both cases, ACK is tagged with N cherry so we can follow the ex this expression. Both beta tubulin and down one are germ cell specific promoters. In beta tubulin, the promoter is on during spermatocytes and then persists in an elongated uh, spermatid. But the ACK expression disappears when the actin cone begins to move. The down one promoter comes, is also germ cell specific, but comes on much later. It comes on when the actin cones are assembled. Again, ACK disappear when the cone begins to move. So here kind of, this slide should summarize the expression uh, temporal um, uh, pattern of the, the two different transgenes. And what we show here is that ACK homozygous, the flies are sterile and there are no sperm in the seminal vesicles. But if you put ACK back, under beta tubulin, now you can restore male fertility as well as the presence of sperm in seminal vesicles. So it's rescued. On the other hand, when you put a down one uh, M cherry back, the male remains sterile and there is no uh, sperm in the seminal vesicles. So conclusion here is that the ACK is required for sperm, uh, spermogenesis in a cell autonomous manner. In addition, we can pinpoint the timing of requirement is between a spermatocyte and, a, and a before the ice, uh, the investment cone uh, assembly. So using the rescue as an assay, we can ask, are the ACK and PR2 function redundant? The answer is no. If we put the ACK back, we can get a rescue. We can get a rescue here. If we put a PR2 back, you see no rescue. And if we put a mouse ACK, uh, mouse ACK back, even though mouse ACK has a crypt, it's still rescue. 
if we put the mouse TNK back, it does not rescue. So this demonstrates that the mouse ACK1 is the functional homolog of Drosophila ACK. And doing this, we can ask what is the critical domains of, of uh, uh, required for ACK function in spinogenesis. So we put, uh, we generate a bunch of mutations, we delete the, the stereo of motif, we mutate the kinase domain, we, mute, we remove the uh, S2 domains, and then we move the clapping binding side, and then we move the UBA. So it's shown here, so wild type full length rescues, but if you remove the stereo of motif, it's not rescued. So that indicates the stereo of motif is critical for HK function. Also, it requires kinase, and it requires the SS3 domain. So the next question, so we, next question is, where is ACK, ACK localized? So to do this, we have uh, ACK tagged with n cherry, and then we look at that as spermatocytes, and then we cross them with the batteries of um, GFP tag uh, organized specific markers. So RAP5 labels early endosome, RAP7 labels late endosomes, RAP11 uh, labels uh, recycling endosome, mitral GFP label mitochondria, Mostly GFP labels membrane and then clathrin labels clathrin. As you can see here, ACK does not overlap with RAP5, RAP7, RAP11, GFP. It doesn't overlap well with the uh, membrane GFP, but it labels very, very well with clathrin GFP. In addition, when you look at the clathrin GFP, you actually can see two populations. You can see those populations around the cell periphery. Also, you see population in internal, and those internal clathrin are next to Golgi. So there are two population of clathrin. Those are involved in endocytosis, and those are, and those involved in secretory pathway. When you look at ACK, ACK only associate with the endocytic clathrin. So the association of, of ACK with endocytic clathrin lead us to propose maybe ACK is involved in endocytosis. So we look at that, and it has been suggested in mammalian cells that ACK is involved in internalization of each receptor and then uh, transferring receptor. So we look at a process, uh, uh, the internalization of the bright of cephalus in the eye disc. So in the eye disc, the bright of cephalus is expressed on, in the RA cells, and then it's internalized into the neighboring cell, which express the cellulose receptor. So when you look, when you stain the eye disc and looking from the top, you can see a big dot of um, boss followed by a trailing dot of boss. The big dot represent the boss on the RA surface, and then the, the small dot represent the internalized uh, part of cells into the neighboring cells. You compare wild type and ACK, there's no difference. So this assay, they show there's no difference in receptor mediated endocytosis of bridal cellulose protein. We look at the clathrin localization. Clathrin localization in ACK null cells, there's no difference. So it's not affected. And also we look at um, another well-established assay. This is Drosophila gallon cells. They are very endocytic. It can, um, Take gallon cell, this gallon cell has carries a RAP7 GLP and then and then incubate the cells in a red tracer. After 20 minutes, you can see a red tracer internalized into the endosomal structure. And you ask, does ACK um, mutation disrupt the, uh, the uptake of tracer? The answer is no. So we look at a, we look at uh, two or three different endocytic assays. The answer is we just cannot find any endocytic defect in ACK mutants. So our conclusion is that ACK has no role in endocytosis. And if there is a role, it's very minor or cargo specific. Okay, so then we have shown that uh, um, the, the same domain, the kinase domain, and then the S2 domain are required for ACK function. Then we ask, are they also required for ACK localization? The answer is, the stereo alpha motif is required for ACK localization, 
when you look at here, when you delete the same domain, ACK becomes cytoplasmic. However, the kinase domain, the kinase domain, even though it's required for its function, it's not required for localization. The kinase that ACK still associate with clothering positive structures. Okay, so, so then the key question is, what are the factors that bind to this ACK kinase? Then a lot of uh, tyrosine kinase associate with adapter protein. So we ask, does ACK associate with NCK, which is an adapter protein with three SS3 domain and one SS2? And this is educated guess because biochemically, um, Trisulfa ACK has been shown to interact with uh, the DOC, which is the fly homolog of NCK in uh, S2 cells. So we ask, we ask, is DOC also like ACK required for um, uh, fly uh, male fertility? And the answer is yes. And this is kind of hard to do because DOC mutants are lethal. DOC has been implicated in axonal path finding. So the way we do this, we generate dark mutants and we put wild type back dark, wild type dark back into uh, the neuronal cells and then the flies are viable, but their test is still missing dark proteins. And it's shown here in wild type, you can see lots of sperm, the needle shaped sperm in a similar vesicles in a dark mutant testes, there are no sperm. So dark like ACK, it's required for male uh, fertility. Then does DOC and ACK form a complex? The answer is yes. If you do an IP with anti-DOC protein, then you take the precipitate and do run a Western, you can detect uh, ACK protein. So if this is a wild type, uh, wild type cell extract, you can detect uh, ACK protein. And then if you do um, use n ACK, you also can detect uh, m ACK. It forms a complex with DOC proteins. In addition, when you look at immunofluorescence, they co-localize. Here is a dark GFP that exists as vesiculous uh, uh, structure around a cell periphery. You overlap with ACK very well. Furthermore, the dark localization requires ACK. So here is dark localization, localization in wild type spermatocytes. It, it is seen as vesicular structure along the cell periphery, but in the um, ACK mutants, that localization is gone. What's left are this ring, ring structure. They are the labels, the cytoplasmic bridges between interconnected spermatocytes. If you put wild type ACK back, you can restore dark localization shown here. So dark is in green and the ACK is in red. However, if you put the kinase dead ACK back, dark remain mislocalized. So that says very importantly that ACK kinase activity is required for dark localization. So then we ask the dark protein, which domain is required for its, import, uh, its own localization? The SS3 is start to bind to protein-rich region of other protein. The SS2 is start to bind to phosphatyrosine. So wild type dark, again, you see vesicular structure along the cell periphery. When you mutate the SS2, that localization is lost. It becomes cytoplasmic. If you mutate the SS3, it still become, it remains vesicular. So that suggests that SS2 domain is critical for dark localization. In addition, we can do a co-IP uh, co and we notice that when you mutate the SS2, the ability of DOC to co-IP with ACK is reduced from 100% to 25%. So DOC is critical for um, its localization as well as ability to interact with ACK. Okay. So another important thing is ACK is autophosphorylated. So this is shown in this uh, simple Western here. 
So we immunoprecipitate full length ACK and then kinase the ACK from testes extract, and you can detect a protein by uh, blotting uh, with uh, antibody against uh, the end cherry. Then when you blot the same blot with 4G10, which detects phosphotyrosine, you can detect the ACK protein, full length protein, but not the kinase that protein. So that suggests the ACK is phosphorylated, and then that phosphorylation requires its own kinase activity. So we conclude ACK it is autophosphorylated. So what we think is going on is that ACK dimerize through the same domain. And that same domain is critical for dimerization. So if you delete the same domain, ACK cannot dimerize and it's not functional. Once ACK dimerize, the autophosphorylates and then generate its generate this phosphotyrosine, which allow the acidic domain of DOC to bind to the phosphotyrosine, then which leads to, in Drosophila leads to spermatic choline, but in cancer cells, it might lead to cytoskeleton uh, uh, arrangement to promote the uh, metastasis. So in summary, here are a few major findings. In Drosophila, ACK is not an essential gene, but it's required for sperm formation. ACK although it lacks the crypt domain, it's the functional home log of mouse ACK1. The same domain, SS3 and the kinase domain are required for ACK function. ACK colloquized with clathrin, but has no apparent role in endocytosis. ACK kinase is, recru is required for recruiting DOC, and DOC is also required for spermogenesis. And then ACK and DOC, ACK and PR2 are not functional redundant. Okay, so that's what we know about ACK. How about PR2? So here is the locus of PR2. And then we actually spend some time to generate uh, strong mutations in PR2, and then the two examples are shown here. EM9 is a point mutation uh, in PR2, and then excision 7 is a deletion in PR2. So when we cross um, these two mutations together, the fly die. This indicates that PR2 is an essential gene. So we remove PR2 function, the fly die. The question is why do the fly die? So we spend some time to figure out where is PR2 required? So we put the wild type PR2 under different promoters. And what we found is that we put muscle promoter, the fly still die. And then when we put uh, PR2 under these neuronal drivers, the fly can survive. So what this suggests is that PR2 is required for animal survival, and this requirement is required in neuronal cells. And use that rescue, we can again pinpoint which domain is critical for PR2 function. So we mutate the kinase domain, we made mutation, uh, permutation to inactivate the SS3 domain, we made a permutation to inactivate the crypt domain, and then the kinase domain is absolutely critical. Shown here, if you mutate the kinase domain, you cannot rescue. But the S domain mutants and then the crypt domain mutants are still functional. In addition, if we put ACK wild type, it cannot rescue. Again, it shows that the ACK and PR2 are functionally non-redundant. PR2 cannot rescue ACK in spermogenesis, and ACK cannot rescue PR2 in neuronal cell functions. Okay, so right now we actually have evidence that PR2 is actually involved in axonal pathfinding, but we're gonna focus on its connection to CDC42 because PR2 has the crypt domain and ACK does not. So to establish that link, we generate a system 
to look at CC42 function. So what is CC42? It's a small GDPS, and it cycles between the, uh, the GDP bound, the inactive state, and then the active state. And then so we express a few different CDC42 in under beta tubing also in germ cells. So here include a wild type, and then uh, the dominant negative, and then the two constituent active mutant. So we do this for a few reasons. And then one reason was that we were actually very intrigued by how the, um, the spermatid elongates. You go from a spherical cell to a 1.8 millimeter cell. In addition, 64 cells do it in synchrony. How is that regulated? And then one thing we were looking at, we were looking at a, a protein complex called exosis, which target secretory vesicle to the membrane. Our hypothesis is that the exosis are actually localized at a specific location in germ cell, and that's in, indeed the case here. You can see a SAC3, which is a mem, it's a component of exosis. In a spherical cell, it's localized at uh, different places, but when the cell begins to elongate, you can see exosis are concentrated at the tip. And this exosis localization are influenced by CDC42. So we're very intrigued, very intrigued by what will happen when you overexpress CDC42 in germ cells. Okay? So, so here's the result. So if you overexpress CDC42 wild type, the flies are fertile, you can see sperm in seminal vesicles, and then the cell division is normal. So here you're looking at the spermatid after meiosis. And then you can tell um, the cell division um, completes normally quite easily in this system because after meiosis, all the mitochondria coalesce into a structure called nubrinkin, as in a dark circle here. And then a light circle is the nucleus. So if the, if the cell division proceeds normally, you see a one dark circle, one light circle configuration. However, when you express activated CDC42, what you see is that there is no sperm in the seminal vesicle. In addition, you see a lot of cells with multiple nuclei associated with mitochondria that indicates the cytokinesis were disrupted. So, so why does CDC42, why does ectopic activation of CDC42 disrupt cytokinesis? This was sort of a mystery. But I think recently a couple papers from uh, Dave Perman's lab and John Pungu's lab suggest that you need to inhibit CDC42 activation, uh, acti activity during mitotic exit to allow the septum formation. So if you have too much CDC42 activity during mitosis, you actually disrupt the septum formation and you have aberrant cytokinesis. So what we think is going on is, and the fly is very similar. And that's shown in this slide right here. So here you have CDC42 wild type uh, labeling GFP. Usually labeled Golgi and then plasma membrane. Spermatocytes also stain with uh, uh, 4G10, which label phosphotyrosine. So it's one of cell periphery. However, when you have activated CDC42, for example, the V12 mutant. The CDC42, instead of local to Golgi, it localized to this very strange structure near the cell surface. And this structure also enrich 
in phosphatyrosine, as you can see in the 4G10 standing here. Moreover, this aberrant CDC42 structure is not random. If you call standard cells with a million, which labels the site of cell division, that's where CTC42 V12 is localized. For some reason, for some reason, that activated CTC42 is recruited to the site of cytokinesis. Okay, so what is annealing? So in animal cells, the constriction at the midbody is facilitated by this actin myosin ring. The question is, what position the actin myosin ring right in the center of the division plane? And quite a bit know about this process. So this process requires uh, a, a, a group called central spindling, which associate with the interdigit central spindles. The central spindling then recruit a protein called ACT2, which is a raw GTP exchange factor. So the central spindling recruit ACT2, then you have localized activation of raw GTPase which then will, uh, through row kinase, will facilitate the formation of this actual myosin uh, ring, as well as the subsequent constriction of this ring. But this ring does not associate with the membrane. So there's another ring, the septin ring, which uh, forms, and the septin ring is associated with the membrane. And the annealing is an adapter that linked the actual myosin ring to the septin ring. So as the actual myosin ring constricts, a neuron coupled to a septin ring will actually also facilitate the septin ring to constrict. So CDC42, as I showed in the previous slide, the, uh, the activated version in Drosophila germ cell is actually localized to a neuron. In addition, shown in here, in addition, the annealing localization is abnormal in CDC42 uh, activated cells. So here in a wild type, you see annealing nicely, nicely, nicely labeled the cytoplasmic bridges. In the mutant, the annealing structure are disrupted. So here are dividing cells, a confocal image, you can see annealing rings, and you cut across this ring, you see two dots, and then CC42 wild type sort of vaguely associated with that structure. But in, in cells expressing activated CC42, those annealing rings are grossly disorganized. So, so what does it have to do with ACK family kinases? It turns out that PR2 mutation can suppress this process. So if you look at CDC42 uh, V12 cells, about 70% of the germ cell will have cytokines defect. In the same background, if you mutate one copy of PR2, the defect drop from 70 to about 25%. So PR2 can genetically suppress that defect, suggests that PR2 act downstream of CD42 in perturbing uh, germ cell cytokinesis. This interaction is very specific. If you knock out one copy of ACK, you don't see the suppression. So the suppression is specific to PR2. Consistent with this, we ask, does PR2 bind to CDC42? The answer is yes. You perform, again, a co-IP uh, with uh, uh, a GAP trap, they pull down CD, CD42. So if in a wild type, it does not bind, it does not pull down PR2 wild type. But if you um, cross uh, PR2 wild type uh, with uh, activated CD42, now you can pull down PR2. So the implication there is that PR2 
preferentially bind to GTP bound CDC42. Again, this interaction is specific. If you do a co-IP with uh, ACK, you see no interaction. So the summary here is that PR2 genetically and then biochemically interact with activated C42. And then how about localization? So here is a M cherry tag PR2 is localized along a cell periphery, and then here is CDC42 wild type. They show a little bit of co-localization. But when you have CDC42 B12, again, it forms this aberrant structure near the site of cytokinesis. You can tell PR2 is being recruited. So again, CDC42 B12 binds to PR2 and alter its localization. So here is what we think is going on. We think expression of CDC42 uh, V12, which is a GTB bound form, disrupt cytokinesis. And the way that works is that there's some recruitment event. We don't quite understand some, some struct, some um, protein that recruits CDC42 in the vicinity of those annealing ring, septin ring, or atomizing ring. CDC42 then, through the interaction with the crypt domain of PR2, then recruit PR2 to the same site. Then PR2 most likely will dimerize through the sterile alpha motif and generate phosphotyrosine and then recruit some protein which then destabilize the ring that's critical for cytokinesis. Okay, and then, so at the end, so summarize here, we have shown you what we've done with the two Drosophila ACK uh, family kinases. ACK is required for sperm formation, and then uh, it acts by recruiting DOC to form some kind of multi-protein complex to promote sperm production. PR2, on the other hand, it's required for animal viability, and that requirement is in neuronal cells. And our current hypothesis is PR2 is required for some axon pathfinding. In germ cell, when you activate CDC42, you can disrupt cytokinesis. And that effect is mediated by, um, by PR2 but not by ACK. And we think that specificity is because PR2 has a crypt domain and ACK does not. So at the end, I would like to summarize, I want to acknowledge people who did the work. And then most of what I've described today is done by a very talented Russian, Abbas Abdallah, who um, did uh, um, um, work on, uh, on ACK. And Giselle and Abbas uh, worked together are uh, characterizing PR2. And this work was done in collaboration with Jim Clements at Purdue University. And then uh, here are the funding from American Heart Association, American Cancer Society, and March of Dime. And that's the end of my talk. And I will stop for questions. Thanks.